As we move right along with our program, I'd now like to call on Brother Peter Kay to introduce our guest speaker, Mr. Greg Crafter. history and uh, sort of known him for such a long time so on an occasion like tonight I feel quite humbled to be given this opportunity to actually uh, introduce you to him. Greg grew up uh, as a co in country South Australia and as a 15 year old he moved to Adelaide. He soon joined the YCW in the, uh, uh, the Semaphore Parish. He went on to become a full-time worker for the YCW five years in Adelaide, and then Port Perry, Wilcana, Wilcana, Kenya, sorry, uh, Forbes, Towns, uh, Townsville, Rockhampton, uh, and in those dioceses. Greg left school after his 11th year and worked firstly at the Harbour Board at Port Adelaide. Then to the court, courthouse, where he became interested in the, la in the law. He studied law uh, as an adult and was personal secretary to the Honourable Len King while he was Attorney General and who later became the Chief Justice uh, in South Australia. He was admitted to the bar in 1987 and in 19, uh, sorry, 78 and 1979 he was selected to the South Australian Parliament succeeding the former Premier Don Dunstan as the member for Norwood. He contested seven uh, elections in Norwood and served as a, a cabinet minister uh, to the 11, for 11 years, including seven as minister of education. Since leaving parliament in 1993, he has enjoyed a very successful career as a company director. During this time, he served as chair of the Global Board uh, of the Geneva-based International Baccalaureate Organisation. He was a long-term member of the Council of the University of Adelaide and is currently a member of the governing board of Torrance University. Greg has now been involved uh, in National Catholic Church responsibilities, including chair of the National Catholic He's Education Christmas Commission, Christmas. a member of the Truth, Justice and Healing Council, which managed the uh, representation of the church before the Royal Commission and institutional responses to child sexual abuse in Australia. He's also a member of the National Board of Calvary Hospitals and Aged Care Services. And in, and in the Archdiocese of Adelaide, he has served on many councils and committees, including those that are responsible for clergy care, diocesan and finances, parish renewal and fundraising. Greg has been married to Ray, a teacher for 49 years. And they have two children and six grandchildren. Please welcome Greg Crafter. opportunity to speak to you on this auspicious occasion, uh, the centenary uh, of uh, the Knights 
here in South Australia. And I acknowledge uh, Archbishop Pat and our Archbishop, Bishop Greg, uh, Reverend Fathers, uh, Chaplains of the Order, Donna Denise Campbell, uh, your State Chair, uh, and Office Bearers of the Order, members of the Order of your partners, and particularly those who have come from interstate to be here uh, for this weekend, ladies and gentlemen. Firstly, I'd like to also acknowledge that we meet on the land of the Ghana people and respect their relationship with the land of the Adelaide Plains and pay our respects to the newly past President of the Virgin. And uh, when I was um, preparing for my words tonight, it reminded me of um, the nights uh, had uh, at Australia Hall regularly for many, many years, as many of you will know, a luncheon club. And uh, when Archbishop Faulkner came back to Adelaide from Townsville, he um, addressed the luncheon club. And uh, one of the things that he talked about, uh, the, one of the things uh, that uh, perhaps worried him the most about his work in North Queensland was the plight of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people. And he talked about the struggles of those people uh, and the problems in that time, in the 1960s and 70s, it was a tough time. And in that diocese was Palm Island, um, which is a, a, a very unfortunate place where so many families have come off the mainland and been placed on that island. But he told a story uh, of having been invited uh, onto the yacht Britannia when the Queen visited Townsville, and he received a special invitation to come to dinner with the Queen. There was just a small group of people there, and she wanted to talk to him about the lot of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I thought it was a very interesting insight into the Queen, her interest uh, in the people of this country, and particularly those who are most disadvantaged in our community. And so that was the, the luncheon club at Australia War. So tonight is um, an occasion for celebration, but it's also a time for reflection. There is much the Church in South Australia has received from the work of the Knights, individually and collectively. And further, much the community of South Australia has received, particularly in the field of aged care and in many other areas of community service, particularly for those who are disadvantaged and in need. Our memories have no doubt been jogged by the events of recent times commemorating the centenary of the formation of this organisation as a quite a unique lay order of the Australian Church. The recognition uh, of the first uh, state chairman, John Stephen Malone, uh, which you've no doubt all been uh, very much aware of, and uh, the placing of a plaque on his grave at the West Terrace ceremony, uh, which is a very important uh, achievement uh, of the order in, in the recognition at this time of where the order began, who was involved in it, and the involvement of his family of today uh, in that ceremony. And the very important publication of Paul Hawkes and uh, Ben Thomas's work as well, uh, a bold story well proven, we'll hear from Paul a little later. But that is not just simply a book about the history of the order over these hundred years, it's also a story of the church uh, in Adelaide and South Australia uh, over that hundred years. You go through the index of the book and there, and there are so many people whose lives just showed up and uh, that we recall and remember uh, and, um, and uh, pay tribute uh, to those people and the influence of the order in the life of the church, in the parishes, the working with the bishops and the priests, uh, with the religious congregations uh, and developing um, the spirituality of the order, uh, the, the sense of mission that is so inherent in the work uh, of the Knights. Uh, I just wanted to say uh, something, uh, perhaps I should also mention the events surrounding this weekend because they're historic as well, the fact that we've been able to meet post-COVID, get together to have these celebrations, visiting the uh, Mary McKillop Centre this <coughs> afternoon, your meetings, the Mass tomorrow, all very important for these celebrations. So in preparing my words this evening, I reflected on my first association with the Knights some 62 years ago in the Semaphore Parish. I was a 16-year-old new member of the YCW branch, as Peter 
mentioned and soon got to know many of the parishioners uh, in Semaphore. It was a very busy parish. We met in groups uh, often uh, to discuss the great encyclicals and the issues of the day. There were a multitude of organisations, services, a school, um, and many activities. Uh, YSW had uh, a football team, basketball teams, we had dancers, uh, socials and so on. There were three priests in our parish in those days. Some of the nights I recognised at early morning weekday masses at Semaphore. They would come in their work clothes and receive communion and then take off before um, mass had concluded so that they could commence work in many of the uh, industries along uh, the river, the Port River, uh, ICI, sulfuric acid works, uh, the, the uh, petrol uh, industry there, uh, heavy engineering, Adelaide Brighton cement and so on. And um, it, it always impressed me that those men up early, um, <coughs> ready for work, but first of all, to receive communion. And I'll talk a little bit about that a little later. Um, a few years later, I became a full-time worker for the YCW at the diocesan level, and soon met uh, the leaders of the Knights at that time, particularly those working uh, in, um, in Angus Street. Russ Hancock, Ted Orchard, Luke Batboy, um, all regulars uh, at diocesan functions and events. Um, John and Joan Brewer, Peter Taylor, Des Hancock, there are so many more. I was, I was going through the index of the book, uh, those names just jumped out. When I became a minister, uh, oh, a mem MP first, uh, but a minister, uh, Peter uh, Taylor and Des used to be the path to my door because there were many issues uh, that uh, the emerging uh, Southern Cross homes were facing uh, and they were seeking some advice and usually some help, often related to money but not always. Um, and uh, on one occasion Peter uh, Taylor was very agitated and uh, he explained to me that uh, the Commonwealth Government had not yet funded a major new nursing home project at the Little Sisters um, on Cross Road at Glen Osmond. And uh, I uh, innocently asked Peter when he wanted to start work on the building start work he exploded. We've already built it. <laughs> we just need the money to pay for it. <laughs> Fortunately, we were able to get the money. On another occasion, and perhaps a more serious one uh, even than that, um, the Premier took me aside after a cabinet meeting one day and um, said to me, um, your friends are in trouble, which was an ominous thing to say to me. I knew what he meant. Um, and uh, it was an occasion where an investment that had been placed in a very uh, public building in South Australia had actually gone bad and uh, the government needed to come to assist otherwise it would have been liquidating some of the assets uh, that, that were in nursing homes. We just couldn't allow that to happen. And so uh, over the years these are the things that members of parliament do and, um, and uh, it's the thing that you don't hear about, like most of the work of the Knights over that hundred years. Not many people knew the work that you did, the important work, the uh, extent of that work, and indeed the breadth and depth of it as well. There were, however, many occasions of a happy nature where I attended openings, state-of-the-art facilities for the aged, and those uh, people who were uh, in their last years of life uh, and the superb facilities uh, that were created for them. And tonight we honour those who have achieved so much, not just in aged care, but in so many other ways through the works of the Knights. Men and women who took risks, made personal sacrifices, and gave of their time and talent to serve others and their church. In 1970, I returned from working for the YSW in Rockhampton and Townsville Diocese and began a law degree um, wanting to have the skills, uh, uh, innocently probably, to bring about change in our state and nation. Little however did I realise that within a year I'd be working in the office of the then Premier Don Dunstan, and two years after that would be the personal secretary to the Attorney General, Len King. It was my faith and my formation as a layman that propelled me into public life. My faith guided me when I was lost, it lifted me up, uh, when I was down and gave me insight into finding solutions to complex issues, the government, society, uh, 
were grappling with and gave me great friends outside of politics. So important if you want to not only survive in politics, but actually make a difference. Glenn King was a devout Catholic who had studied theology whilst he did his law degree on a scholarship after World War II. Um, when he graduated, he applied for articles of clerkship at a well-known law firm, only to be told that we don't employ Catholics in this practice. And this was the 1950s. Um, and I'm sure that spurred Len into wanting to change the laws relating to discrimination and create a fairer and more just society where opportunities for employment advancement were not in the hands of a powerful few. Politics is a great learning experience. Now I'll relate two very real learning experiences for me. And they were both door knocking and as a politician in a marginal seat, and I have uh, faced many elections, I spent a lot of my life uh, knocking on people's doors and introducing myself or renewing old acquaintances. And the very first one was the day after I was pre-selected uh, when Don Dunstan uh, resigned, uh, went through a pre-selection process and was nominated as the candidate in that seat. And I still remember the house, it's still there, it's in St. Peter Street, St. Peter's. I knocked on the door and a little old lady came up and very kindly said, look, I'm pleased to meet you. Um, and I uh, read about you in the paper. Um, and she called out to her husband, she said, come out and uh, meet this man. And so we had a chat for a while and she said to me, um, look, it's really nice to talk to you. She said, would you come and have a cup of tea? And I said, look, thank you very much, but I've got so many people that I need to meet. Uh, would you mind if I didn't come in? And she looked at me and she said, Don always came and had a cup of tea. <laughs> and, uh, and I went and had a cup of tea. <laughs> and, uh, and the reality is that you probably win more votes from going into one house and having a cup of tea and learning about that, those people and their families than knocking on 100 doors quickly uh, and trying to get through uh, that task. And it was a real lesson for me. So I drank a lot of tea. But I learned a lot about people as well. And that's really what politics is about. It's not only understanding people, but it's actually uh, having uh, the time and the inclination to know people deeply. And if you can do that, then I think it could be much more beneficial in trying to change laws and to make sure the administration works for people. And that's always a great challenge. The second case was another door knocking experience in 10th Avenue, St. Peter's, take you to the house again. This is a long time ago. But I knocked on the door, it was a screen door, and you couldn't see through, you know, one of those secure doors. And uh, I said, my spiel was, uh, I'm, my name's Greg Crafter, I've uh, just come. The, the voice had said hello, and I thought, someone's there behind the door, they may be a little afraid to come out. I said, my name's Greg Crafter, I'm the local member of parliament. Um, I'm coming to visit people uh, before the election and say hello and see if there's some way that I can help. And the boy said hello again. And uh, so I got a little bit closer to the door. I thought the person might be hard of hearing. So a bit louder, I said, my name is Greg Crafter. I'm the local member and went through my spiel and the boy said hello again. So I was a little worried at that stage and I thought, look, i just go through it once more time. So I went through it once more. My name is Greg Crafter, but the nose on the door. And I looked down, and there was a copy in a coach. <laughs> <laughs> Another big lesson for me. And uh, I, was, I was a bit upset, actually, so I put my calling card in the copy stage. <laughs> but I thought afterwards, there's something there about one of God's creatures that was saying something to me as well. And that lady or man who lived in that place had trained a bird to sit out the front and say hello to people. <laughs> so uh, another learning for you. But Pope Francis speaks to us often about keeping the doors of our church open. Not just the physical church, uh, but in our own relationships and dealings with people in our associations and our church organisations in our schools, our hospitals, and our welfare services. The laity, that's you and I, uh, have an important role to play in ensuring our church is able to smell the sheep, as the Pope asks us to do. Uh, he wants for us not to be a church of the poor, but a poor church, a church where the poor feel at home, welcome, and understood. In the Southern Cross this month, 
there is a wonderful article. You've probably uh, seen it. If you haven't, uh, it's uh, a full-page uh, article about this celebration. Knights celebrate 100 years of service. And I was taken by the photograph uh, here. It's with, in 1940 at the Bishop's House on West Terrace um, with Archbishop Beardage uh, and uh, two chaplains being presented uh, with a mass kit. And I thought uh, just how uh, that, that resonates with the work over the 100 years uh, of, uh, of the Knights. Uh, this to me is a great symbol of what lies at the very heart and soul of your order as a lay order of the church. The importance of the Mass in our lives. And it is a kit that takes the Mass to where there is no church, in the bush, in the homes where there are the sick, in the prisons and hospitals, schools and workplaces. A priest once, uh, during my time in the Wyoming, said in explaining the relevance of the Mass to young people, uh, in our daily life, said these words, what we eat and drink today walks and talks tomorrow. <laughs> this helped me to understand what it is to receive communion. That is, each time we attend Mass, we become more Christ-like. Or if I could paraphrase St. Paul, who says, says we, don't, we do not live now, but it's Christ who lives within us. And so the Mass is at the centre, I think, not only of our faith, but our work as the laity that sustains us uh, and, uh, and continues to open up uh, that well uh, that is ours as lay people in the church. I look back on my own formation as a layman, and many of you uh, present this evening will have had similar experiences in your own growth and in your own faith. Every day we begin again. We learn to reflect on the Gospels. We reviewed our own daily lives and collectively as a group we took action uh, to build a stronger community in our parish, or in the wider community, in our workplace, or in our families. We had the great insights of our chaplains and mentors and their guidance and encouragement. We were taught to speak in public, to chair meetings, to take minutes, to organise events, to experience the empowerment of our faith gave us and a greater role in the life of our church. As Pope Francis says uh, in his exhortation, the joy of the Gospels, the laity have a right to faith formation, formation for mission, a formation that will allow us not only to serve the church, as important as that is, but to engage in the transformation of society. So with those words, I look forward to the next hundred years of the night's work as a great lay order of the Catholic Church in Australia, in whatever form that might take in the future, and whatever the needs of the community and the church are, that you have dedicated yourselves to them. Good luck. Thank you very much. Uh, Brother Ian Fleetwood to give a vote of thanks. Can I say thank you for eating very quietly while Greg was talking? <laughs> thank you very much, Greg, for a very interesting talk. Uh, I could see parallels between your life and Thanks the life of the night. Uh, it's been quite interesting. But one of the things that I did this was Peter Chase's production. There was a door. Red legs, or did you grow up in semaphore and you bury it before what Adelaide? That was completely missed. Thank you very much for your time and it was much appreciated.